folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is a place for all things sci-fi and fantasy, with a special emphasis on that most wonderful subgenre, steampunk. Today, we're going to talk about steampunk. Yes, we're actually going to talk about our core, core interest. And I'm going to talk about the very first steampunk book I ever read, it was recommended to me when I asked, when I became interested and asked, what's the best steampunk book? book to read, and they said, well, this is a YA, it's a young adult uh, book, but it's very good, and it's called Leviathan by Scott Westerfeld, and it was part of a trilogy, so I'm going to talk about this trilogy. But before we get started, I'm going to mention uh, a couple of my works again, because that's part of the reason I'm here, and it is Fidelis Automata, and, uh, which is a novel involving a Cuban inventor who comes to America to work with uh, to work with Thomas Edison, and he ends up meeting Nikola Tesla as well. <clears throat> and his spider, his mechanical spider invention, is stolen and put to various purposes. So it's it's kind of a, it's kind of got a similar vibe to uh, the Leviathan trilogy, but a little bit more adult. And it's uh, got also got a prequel, which I have published as a short story. Available as an ebook on Amazon called Fidelio's Dilemma, which involves Fidelio, some of his experiences as a uh, young man in Havana, which makes him make him decide to come to America against his father's wishes, who would rather have him, you know, take up a more respectable uh, profession than inventor. <clears throat> now I've got that out of the way. Let's get started. The Leviathan trilogy started with the book Leviathan. Uh, and continued with the book of Behemoth and finished up with Goliath. All three uh, great book names involving the concept of huge size. I love it. And plus there was a fourth companion companion book uh, called the uh, Manual of Aeronautics, which was published after those three, which is basically illustrations by Keith Thompson, who did, did uh, in in chapter illustrations also uh, for the Leviathan trilogy, which is kind of interesting. Not very many people do that in American publishing, even in YA, and, but it's a lot of fun. It's got that old-timey feel because back in the day, early 20th century, there were a lot of books with illustrations in them. And in fact, Mrs. Desperado and I, when we did our IOD series, we also put in illustrations. Uh, because we wanted that old-timey feel, so it's it's pretty cool. I really like it because of that, and, T and Keith Thompson's illustrations are great. I may show some of them briefly. I mean, uh, kind of a kind of a fair use thing because this is a review. How shall show you the audience how awesome his work is. Westerfeld is more int more famous for a series called Uglies, which is a dystopian series, also more or less YA, I believe, uh, about a future where uh, conformity and beauty are the obsessions of the society, which hmm, sounds kind of like a, a slightly increased version of our current world. <clears throat> anyway, it's gotten so much, it's gotten a lot more press and, and attention than the Leviathan trilogy. In fact, it was optioned for a movie, and uh, which didn't get made yet, and now I guess Netflix wants to do it. Unfortunately, just for whatever reason, Steampunk just hasn't had the traction that other works have had. In fact, I think it's why authors like Westerfeld, as talented as, as he is and as wonderful as his Steampunk is, kind of moved away from the genre. Hopefully, that will change. These books were published in the what I call the era of peak Steampunk, starting in 2009, and each year thereafter, 2010, 2011, 2012. They are essentially an alternate history of World War One, also called, at the time, the Great War, because they didn't expect there would be another World War. And this was the war to end, up, end all wars, after all. And uh, so because of that, this would be more correctly called diesel punk, because it's, it's past the Victorian era. It's in, in a time when uh, diesel was becoming more important than steam as a power source. Still, uh, it's fair enough to call it steampunk. The Wikipedia article, and it's Wikipedia's usual very surface 
very surface analysis of anything. Uh, it also calls it as biopunk, which because of the gen genetic engineering component. And biopunk's kind of an interesting uh, subgenre, which people don't hear much about. I will probably have to talk about that at some point <clears throat> after I've read a few more of the uh, representative works. Anyway, the premise is, it's what I consider fantasy science in that the um, societies in uh, early 20th century could, couldn't have possibly come up with, uh, realistically anyway, couldn't have possibly come up with genetic engineering to the scale. <clears throat> also, so, so that's one of the two sides of the conflict. This is the, um, the side with Britain and France and, and Russia on it. And they're called Darwinists because they are heavy into genetic engineering. They do some really cool things. The other guys, the Germans, the Austro-Hungarians, and the Ottomans, aka the Turks, they are into mechanics, uh, robots like like the storm stormtrooper walkers from from Star Wars, which is also a little bit out of that of ra uh, range, but a little bit more realistic. And they are called clankers. <clears throat> It's a very, very cool premise between these two technologies. The fact the Brits have, have gone so far as to have animals to do almost everything, like you know, giant elephants that can do construction and, and uh, bear loads and stuff. Uh, they have um, a lot of, uh, they've bred like sea creatures to be, uh, uh, to be uh, weapons in the, in, the, in the water and in the ocean. And, and but best of all, they have have uh, giant whales that have been uh, mutated into airships. They contain hydrogen in their air sacs, and so they can fly fly through the sky. And they're alive, basically. And they they have uh, these special sniffer animals because the hydrogen is dangerous, flammable, and these are like dogs with spider DNA. They can sniff for hydrogen. They they can stick to the to the envelope, and they kind of wander around, uh, checking out, keeping it safe. They also have a, a smaller kind of balloon called Huxley, which was named after a, a famous uh, biologist, uh, kind of a disciple of Darwin. And it is a jellyfish that that flies, you know, flies in, uh, you know, fills with hydrogen and can fly. <clears throat> also alive. Anyway, the main characters, there's a girl, Scottish girl, teenager, I think about 15 or so, and a uh, hung Austrian prince, probably around the same age. And as you might expect, <laughs> there's a little bit of an expectation that these two characters meet, they may become romantically involved, perhaps. Anyway, uh, the girl is called Darren Sharp. And she is fascinating with, fascinated with flight. Her father was a balloon pilot who unfortunately died on, uh, in a crash. Still, she wants to become a balloon pilot herself, which is kind of a problem because she's a girl. And it's a really definitely a problem that she can't join the Royal Air Navy. So she decides to run away from home. She impersonates a boy uh, and uh, takes the exam because <laughs> she knows a little bit about flying from her father. And she has to fly one of these, one of these uh, Huxleys, and it kind of gets out of control and lands her on His Majesty's airship uh, Leviathan, which is where the title comes from. And so they take Darren on as a crew member. Of course, Darren has adopted a boy's name, Dylan Sharp, and is pretending to be a boy. And she's also a couple years too young to actually join, join the Air Navy. So she has to keep these two secrets. Now, the boy, the Austrian prince, is called Alexander Ferdinand, Alc for short. He's been pursued by some evil, nefarious people who want to assassinate him. Kind of like they were kind of behind the plot to assassinate his, his uncle and aunt, the Archduke, and his wife. So he escapes in one of these mechanical walkers because he's, you know, he's in the, he's, you know, studying for the military, and he has his um, guardian, uh, Wild Count Bolger. I'm not sure what a Wild Count is. Maybe it's Wild Count in German. And he's kind of he's kind of a schemer, and because uh, he's he's like holding back some information that's important.
from Al, from Alec, and the other guy is Otto Klopp, who is the his his tutor, is teaching him mechanics. As far as Darren, aka Dylan, she meets this scientist on board the Leviathan. They are they are going to Constantinople, Constantinople also known as Istanbul, uh, for a secret mission to try and I guess to try and win the Ottomans over, and this scientist is a woman, Nora Barlow, with, who has this information. And she is Charles Darwin's granddaughter. And in real life there was Nora Barlow, who was Charles Darwin's granddaughter. However, in this world, she's done a lot of genetic engineering that didn't really happen, like, you know, modifying the animal, the loris, <laughs> which is this cute little fuzzy jungle creature. In this world, they can talk, and so they're called perspicacious loris. So Nora Barlow kind of becomes a mentor for uh, for Darren, but uh, Darren is worried that she'll discover that she's actually a girl and, and tell on her, and then she'll be kicked out of the Royal Air Navy. And so, so that's kind of a conflict. And they end up being attacked by a German Zeppelin, which is like the regular mechanical Zeppelin, and landing on a glacier in Switzerland. At the same time, Alec has fled to Switzerland in his walker, and they encounter each other, and, and he and his crew help the uh, with their machine, with their engines, I guess their steam engines, or diesel engines, I'm not sure which, from the walker to help get the uh, Leviathan off, off again. And so they, the two characters, Alec and uh, Darren, eventually become friends, etc., etc. So they have some adventures, which are which are pretty fascinating. The second book takes them to uh, Constantinople as expected and they have these adventures in Turkey where they're undergoing a revolution which really happened the uh, young Turks basically they take over and get rid of the Sultan and make it into a secular state with the uh, the great man Ataturk uh, kind of did that and they encounter a young Kurdish girl who becomes kind of a friend of theirs who's one of the revolutionaries third book um, Goliath, they move on to Russia, where they meet Nikola Tesla, who <laughs> he really, he really, um, he really pops up in just about half the steampunk you ever read, because he was such an eccentric genius. Of course, this one almost, this book almost portrays him as a little bit of a lunatic. <laughs> uh, and uh, they end up going from there, they end up going to Japan and Mexico, with they meet well, Pancho Villa and to America. And so it's, it's another good, good adventure, another, another stirring adventure with lots of, uh, lots of uh, harrowing escapes. So I hope I haven't given too many things away. But obviously, you know, there's three books so that they've got to survive till the end of the third, right? Anyway. <clears throat> This was a great deal of fun. I really enjoy the illustrations. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a fun style. The characters are great. My only slight problem was uh, some of uh, Westerfeld's style. He's a little repetitive with some words and phrases. He got a little annoying. For example, Dern's catchphrase is, get ready for it, barking spiders. Kind of like Orphan Annie always said, leaping lizards. And it's because I think it refers to those engineered uh, dog spiders, uh, but uh, it it gets a little annoying. She she needs a, a new catchphrase occasionally, <laughs> uh, and uh, also the scientists are called boffins. It's kind of British slang, and, and it just they call boffins all the time. Did you forget the word scientist? <laughs> occasionally, you'd like want to be a little bit more formal, I would think. Uh, but it, anyway, it's, it is it is definitely very cool and very fun, and I highly recommend it. I would probably, out of my scale of five gears, I'd probably give it four and three quarters, just to, just to delete, delete a little bit for my annoyance. But other people probably won't be, probably won't have that issue sometime. Also, I have not seen the manual of aeronautics, which I'll probably have to get just as a collector's item at some point, just for the illustrations. Usually that's less of a priority for me. So this has been my review of, of Scott Westerfeld's Leviathan Trilogy, which includes the books Leviathan, Behemoth, 
and Goliath. Awesome book names. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me on this review. Please like and subscribe. Please let me know what you thought of it and of these books in the comments below. If there's any steampunk works that you might want me to check out, although I've read about 70 of them as, as, as of right now. So for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios Amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.